Good morning. Good to be back with you. It's been, boy, I think two weeks, three weeks since I've actually uh, had the chance to, to preach. So uh, it is very nice. I enjoyed the break, but it's been great to hear from uh, some of the other speakers as well that we've had. So I want to show you a picture of somebody. Drum roll, please. I don't suppose that many people here actually know who this is. Anybody know? Okay, well, this is a picture of a guy by the name of Robert Engel. And just eight days ago, nobody really knew who this guy was. I mean, he wasn't a famous actor. He uh, hadn't invented anything that everybody knew about. He didn't hold an upfront public position in his community. And he would very easily fit into a large crowd of people without being noticed. In fact, there was nothing unique or outstanding at all about this guy. Engel is a 22-year-old, and among other things, he attends Burnett Chapel, which is a small Church of Christ congregation in Antioch, Tennessee. All this accounts to the fact that he loves his church and apparently spends a lot of his spare time volunteering in men's ministry and the church's property team. And last Sunday, he was even serving as an usher. By all accounts, it was a normal Sunday, and all of the familiar people were sitting in their familiar pews until something happened. Watch this. Morning service had just ended at Burnett Chapel Church of Christ in Nashville when a man wearing a ski mask drove into the parking lot and jumped out with the engine still running. Armed with a handgun, investigators say, he shot and killed a woman coming out of the church, then went inside and opened fire. This is a level one uh, mass casualty incident. People were just running and hiding and trying to get out, get away. Police say the church usher tackled the gunman who beat him with a pistol and then another shot. During the struggle, the gunman shot himself, probably not intentionally, in the left pectoral muscle, in the left chest. A woman who was in the church says the man firing the shots never said a word. He came from in front of the church from the parking lot and he was shooting and then he stood in the pulpit and he started shooting more and looking to his left. And that's when he came in the front, in the middle. And then this guy came and fighting with him and tackled him down. She says she works at a VA hospital and helped control the bleeding on one of the gunshot victims. Police say that injured usher, 22-year-old Robert Engel, ran to his car and got a gun, then made sure no further shots were fired while waiting for the police to arrive. He's the hero. Uh, he's the person that stopped this madness, and so uh, we're very, very, very grateful uh, to him. Six others were shot inside the church, all adults, four in their 60s and two in their 80s. They were taken to a nearby hospital. Police tonight say... So as the story would later be told, the services at the church were just ending last Sunday when this gunman would enter, and uh, he was later identified as a former member of the congregation. He shot and killed Melanie Smith, who was that woman that was walking to her car. And um, the gunman then uh, entered the church with a pair of handguns and just started randomly shooting with almost 50 people inside. And that's when, as you heard, Robert Angle sprang into action. He ran to his car to get his own gun and then came back to the church where he tackled and fought with the suspect and in the process suffered a fairly significant head injury. He uh, eventually wrestled the shooter to the ground and held him there until the police arrived. So when it was all said and done, one person was dead and seven were injured, as you heard. But police would later say that it would have been a lot worse if Robert had not acted as quickly as he did. So Robert went from being a zero to a hero in just a few minutes. So let me ask you, what do you think makes someone a hero? The dictionary defines a hero as a person who is admired or idolized for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. So a hero can be someone who does something courageous like Robert, or it can even be someone that you look up to and want to model or emulate part of your life after. 
So who are your heroes? Maybe it's easy for you to look back at your own life and at different uh, points in your life and remember someone who intervened when you desperately needed someone to do that. Maybe it was a parent or a friend or a doctor or a police officer or maybe even a complete stranger. I mean, maybe your hero is someone who's accomplished something in a field that really does mean a lot to you. You know, if you're a businessman, maybe your hero is Bill Gates. If you're a hockey player, maybe your hero is Connor McDavid or Patrick Laine or Sidney Crosby. If you have a humanitarian heart for people, maybe your hero is Mother Teresa. If you're a guitar player, maybe it's Eddie Van Halen. Or if, it's, if your desire is to be a rock star philanthropist millionaire, maybe your hero is Bono. The point that I'm trying to make is that we all have heroes. We all have people who in certain areas of our life, we really do want to be just like them. I also wonder for those of us who are committed followers of Jesus, if we have any spiritual heroes. One of my spiritual heroes is a man by the name of Steve Saint. I don't know how many of you have heard of him, but his father was Jim Elliott, who many of you might know as a Wycliffe missionary who along with four other missionaries were killed in Ecuador many years back by a tribe that they believed God had called them to bring the gospel to. Well, Steve Saint was Jim Elliott's son, and when he was of age, Steve went back to that unreached people group that had killed his dad and brought them the life-changing gospel. I had a chance to meet Steve a number of years ago when the church I was working at was hosting Mission Fest, and we connected, and I was incredibly inspired by the time that he and I were able to spend together. And when we parted ways, Steve gave me a gift, and it was made by the tribe that were once killers, but now almost every member of that tribe follows Jesus. And it was a necklace with some beads and a claw on it from some kind of animal. And as Steve gave it to me with tears in his eyes, he explained that it was worn by the spiritual leaders of this Ecuadorian tribe. And when he gave it to me, he said, Bruce, it's a symbol of what it means to be a bold and fearless leader. And to this day, that has incredible significance to me. And you know, for what Steve did in going back to that tribe, he is a hero. And I want to be like him, and I want to emulate his courage and conviction, no matter where God places me. So again, I ask you, as you're sitting in the pew, do you have any spiritual heroes? Now, I think deep down, we all are naturally wired to need heroes. Do you agree with that? I mean, to prove that, you really don't have to go any further than thinking about the top grossing movies so far in 2017 year, uh, 2017, because all of the stories are stories of heroes. These are the top three. The first one is Wonder Woman, and it's a story of Diana, this Amazonian warrior who leaves her secluded island home to help the British fight the war to end all wars. The second highest grossing film is Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and it tells the story of the Guardians of the Galaxy, this group of five different creatures who fight to save the universe. The third is Spider-Man Homecoming, and it tells the story of Peter Parker, who tries to balance his life as an ordinary high school student in Queens with his superhero alter ego, Spider-Man. So why do you think people flock in droves to see movies like this, paying hundreds of millions of dollars along the way? Well, I believe it has something to do with the fact that all of us are wired to be inspired by stories of people who do extraordinary things for causes that are greater than themselves. We're attracted by courage and bravery and commitment of people that remind us that if they can make a difference, then maybe we can make a difference too. And sometimes... Those stories even inspire us to be better and to live differently. And with all of that said, have you ever wondered why so much of our Bible is made up of stories? I mean, chronicling the life and the faith of people who lived uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. I mean, if God had things that he wanted us to learn from Scripture and to know about him, and if he really wanted to help us understand his plan for the world, I mean, why not just give us a textbook? Why not just give us an instruction manual? 
You know, why not give us a step-by-step instruction manual, you know, in a really well-written one like IKEA furniture? You know, why not do that instead of giving us a book that is filled with a lot of different stories? You ever wonder about that? I mean, why do you think he chose to communicate so many of his most important truths through stories? Well, I believe it's because God has wired us to function best when we have true, inspiring stories of heroes that can show us the way. And in some cases, stories of ordinary people that do extraordinary things. Stories that remind us that we can do it. We can make a difference. We can be brave and courageous and do big things for God too. And that is exactly what we want to talk about over the next nine weeks. There's this incredible chapter in the New Testament book of Hebrews. In fact, in most of your Bibles, if you look at the title, it's called either Faith in Action or Heroes of the Faith. And the chapter lists this group of people who figured out how, in tangible ways, to put their faith into action. It's a chapter that was written to say, if you're looking for heroes of the faith, people look up to people to model your life after, people to emulate. If you're looking for a list of faith's superheroes, here's a great place to get started. What I love so much about this list is that most of the people on it are really very relatable, and most of them weren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They weren't born into this superhero status. This is a list of ordinary people who chose to say yes to God. And then went on to do extraordinary things. In fact, superhero of the faith types of things. And we're going to spend the next nine weeks looking at some of those heroes and their stories. And I think that what we're going to discover together is that in all of their stories, there is a profound reminder that if we, if you and I just are willing to say yes to God, then we too can become the kind of spiritual heroes that our world is desperate for. What I want us to do this morning is to take a look at the context of Hebrews 11 because this historic list of faith's heroes is bracketed. It's kind of like it's got bookends around it by a couple of passages that give us some important insights into what, in fact, makes these people heroes. And I believe that the answer will likely be a shock to you. So Hebrews 11 starts off with a verse that's likely very familiar to a lot of us. The author writes this, and I'm reading from the NIV. It says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I mean, it's such an interesting verse, isn't it? And it's a verse that's often quoted when someone is looking for a great definition of what faith really is. I mean, I wonder if that's ever happened to you. Somebody's asked you what is faith, and maybe you've quoted this verse to them. The NASB translates the verse this way. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But probably my favorite translation and interpretation of this verse is the King James, which says, Now faith is the the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Greek word in this verse that we translate as faith is actually used 24 times in this chapter alone. And it's important to know that there's a number of Greek words that are translated in English as faith. But this particular Greek word is intended to be much more of an insider language word. In fact, it's referring to a person's relationship with God that's characterized by a deep experiential understanding of God's faithfulness and his trustworthiness. In fact, when this verse talks about faith, it's not so much a theological definition of faith, but it's intended to be more of an insider's definition and one that's based on already having a relationship with God, already having had that encounter with him. And it's trying to paint for the reader this picture of faith faith being this practical outworking of an already active and growing relationship with God. In fact, this verse is intended to be read this way if you translate it literally. Now, faith in his trustworthiness and faithfulness is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So why is all of that important to know? Well, 
what I want us to grasp here is that this passage is intended to be much more of an insider conversation with people who've already had that profound encounter with God. I mean, it's important that we understand that because I think many of us have been guilty of thinking that we can use this as a definition of faith to those who are pre-Christians. Let me put it another way. I mean, if you're a pre-Christian and you're searching and maybe you have intellectual barriers that are preventing you from putting your faith and trust in Christ, this might be the worst answer that you could hear. I mean, there's no comfort here. There's no answers here. This passage isn't answering your doubts or addressing your barriers. In fact, it's acknowledging that if you allow those doubts and questions to become barriers, then faith, quite frankly, is unattainable for you. If you ever studied the history of Christianity, then you know that down through history, there have been different times, different periods, where the study of apologetics has seemed to dominate a lot of the Christian conversation. I mean, many of us, including myself, have spent hours and hours studying topics that we felt we needed to be able to defend should we ever be asked questions about those things. But this passage is clear that faith, I mean real faith, a faith that has substance and real faith that trusts that this type of real faith has less to do with having all of your questions answered and more to do with your ability to trust in what you have not seen. And these verses are paving the way, really, for this whole list of heroes. Because think about this with me. This whole list of heroes, they are a group of people who hadn't seen Christ perform any miracles. They hadn't heard him teach. They hadn't walked with him. They hadn't seen him die and then rise from the dead. They weren't, uh, not one of them saw him before he ascended back into heaven. Their faith was based solely on what? It was based solely on what we're told, what they hoped for. The passage continues. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. You know, in my many years as a pastor, in my many years of sharing my faith, in my many years of of having the privilege of leading people to the Lord, I can tell you that the barriers to people accepting Christ are rarely apologetic arguments. I mean, even if their questions could be answered, that likely still wouldn't be enough. So this passage says, it asks the question, what were the ancients commended for? For having a faith and a confidence and a hope and an assurance in what they had not seen. And this, my friend, is the type of faith that we are told in this passage to emulate, a faith that doesn't always need to have proof, a faith that doesn't always need to have scientific data to back it up. This faith clings to the hope in what we don't see. It's this faith that is so in tune with the heart of God that we willingly say yes to his promptings based on what? Based on his trustworthiness and not scientific data. And this faith is one of the identifiable characteristics, we're told, of the heroes that are about to be mentioned. Verse 3 continues, and it says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. I wonder how many of you remember the story of Thomas, or doubting Thomas, right, as he's come to be known story is told in John 20, and in a, in a way, it's an illustration of what the Hebrew authors is attempting to communicate here. Starting in verse 24 of John 20, this is, what, this is how the story goes. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So John here is referring to one of the sightings after Jesus' resurrection. And for whatever reason, we don't know why, but Thomas just wasn't there. Verse 25, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he, that being Thomas, said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And there's a lot of people out there today who I think are just like that. You know, he just couldn't do it. He couldn't bring himself to believe unless there was some physical proof, some empirical evidence 
He, unless he could see it with his eyes and touch, his, touch it with his hands. He just could, couldn't buy it. The passage goes on, verse 26. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. And then he said, I'm sure staring Thomas down. He says, Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And the author of Hebrews is saying the same thing here. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for, the assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So the author of Hebrews starts by giving us this this definition of what real faith is, this insider definition. And then he does one better than that because he says, now I'm going to give you some examples. He says, I'm going to give you some stories to look up in your spare time. I'm going to give you some stories that I want you to read because I know that they will inspire you. We're not going to read through verses 3 to 38 because we're going to be learning a lot more about this group of people in the weeks to come. But I want you to take a look at some of the people who he lists here on this next slide. These are some of the people that he lists. Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Esau, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, and Samuel. And after, after talking about all of these heroes of the faith, I love how the author summarizes them. Because he says in verse 38, this is what he says. He says, the world was not worthy of them. The world was not worthy of them. The author is saying, pattern your faith and pattern your walk with God. Pattern your trust Pattern your faithfulness. Pattern your lives after these people who believed with such passion and trust that they didn't have all the benefits of knowing or understanding God's big picture plan. You know, as I was preparing for this sermon this week, it occurred to me, I am convinced that some of us who have been Christians for a long time are kind of like high needs children to God. You know, we, we become so needy at times because so many of us are constantly asking God to prove himself to us. I mean, we pray and he answers our prayer. We pray again and he answers our prayer. We pray again and he doesn't answer us right away and slowly our doubts creep in and we start to wonder, did, did he actually hear us? You know, is he, is he actually listening? Does he really care? And I'm sure God looks down at us in those moments and maybe scratches his head and says, Really, people? I wonder if you ever do that. The author of Hebrews is saying, Pattern your lives after these spiritual heroes who never, not one of them, had the benefit of seeing with their own eyes and touching with their own hands the fulfillment of what God wanted to do, and yet they faithfully believed and did extraordinary things for God. Well, remember me telling you that this list of spiritual superheroes was actually bracketed or bookmarked with two incredible and important passages. Well, after defining what real faith is and then reciting this powerful list of spiritual superheroes, the author of Hebrews writes this, starting in verse 39 of of chapter 11. He says, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, that being the promised Messiah. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And then he goes on to do something really interesting because he answers a question that was incredibly important to the Jewish people. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, was written to uh, predominantly Jewish Christians. So they knew all of these characters very well. They knew the stories. 
And Paul knows that the readers are likely incredibly inspired already by the great acts of faith of the people that were on that list. And then it's as if he's, he's giving them the climax or the conclusion or the punchline. And he says to them in the first three verses of Hebrews 12, chapter 12, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. He's saying that we're no different than these heroes who had the world watching them too. And I wonder if we as followers of Jesus fully grasp this. Do we fully grasp that when we claim to be a follower of Jesus, that the world will start watching you with different eyes? They're watching you and waiting to see what's going to happen. The author says, throw off or throw away everything that hinders you and the sin that so easily entangles us. Does that not define sin for all of us? It just so easily entangles us. The author is saying, throw away the things that distract you. Throw away the things that pull your focus elsewhere. Throw away the things that prevent you from moving forward. Throw away the things that slow you down. Throw away those things that prevent you from saying yes to God. He's saying, throw away the sin that so easily entangles all of us and prevents us from being the hero that our world really needs. Just throw it away. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. You know, I'm convinced after studying this list of simple, ordinary people in Hebrews 11 that spiritual heroes are not born, but they are grown. They're grown as people of faith, as you and I throw off the things that hinder us and throw off the sin that so easily entangles us. As we run with perseverance the race that he has marked out for us, and as we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, and I love this word, the perfecter of our faith. Talking about Jesus, the author of Hebrews goes on to write, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. My friends, these are heroes that are worth following. You know, the big thing that I want you to take away from this this morning is that God truly is in the business of taking ordinary, flawed people like you and me. And when they're willing to say yes to him, he will enable them to do extraordinary things for him, exactly in the world that he has placed them in. He will take the person who is plain and ordinary and turn them into a spiritual superhero that will change their world. But you know, we all have a choice, don't we? We have a choice not to fight those things that hinder us, not to fight the sin that entangles us. We can refuse to run with perseverance and refuse to follow the race that's been marked out for us. You can choose not to fix your eyes on Jesus and instead fix your eyes on people and problems and things of the world. And you can live your lives in this perpetual state of always saying no to him when he asks us to do something. And some here have likely made that decision. Or you can start something new today. You can say, I'm going to throw off the things that hinder me from becoming all that God wants me to be. I'm going to throw off the sin that has had too strong of a grip on me. We can run with perseverance the race that he has planned for you. And you can fix your eyes on Jesus. And you know what? When we do that, when we say yes to him, do you know what happens? You too can become the superhero that he is looking for. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you so much for the wisdom in this, in this passage. And we, 
acknowledge to you that we are people who, who need role models, need people to show us the way. And I thank you for this incredible list of, of these spiritual heroes that we can learn from and we can understand from and we can pattern our lives after. Father, we realize that you're also calling us to live the kind of lives that will set the pace for the people coming after us. As this passage says, we know that when we claim you, when we claim the name of Christ in our own lives, that we have eyes that are watching us. We have people that are looking to us. And Father, I I pray that you would help us to run the race with perseverance. We can't do that alone. We need your help. Lord, I thank you so much that you are so willing to offer that to us. This morning, we're beginning this journey, Lord, of looking at the lives of these heroes that are talked about. I pray that you would open up our hearts to whatever it is you want us to learn from them. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.